I don't often feel compelled to do this, but it's important that I give a content warning for this case, that we both give a content warning for this case. Yes. Because this is not your average case. There are themes of torture, sexual assault, and ultimately murder. I know we've covered cases like that before, but this is probably one of the worst single killings that I have ever come across. And kind of content warning as well with this. We're going to let you behind the curtain a little bit. Often with podcasts, it would seem like we're doing this all in one take, but we don't. It's usually different clips and we'll do it from time to time. I will say this intro is the last thing we're recording. And just as a content warning, if you are easily upset with people getting upset over things, just kind of be cautious with this because I could not keep it together for part of this episode and I don't think we're editing that out. If you feel compelled to support us, the social media links are in the descriptions. You know where to find them. But with all of that out of the way, this is the Junko Furuta case. Junko Furuta was a Japanese high school student who was abducted, tortured, raped, and murdered in the late 1980s. Her murder case was named Concrete Encased High School Girl Murder Case. That's a mouthful. When you translate Japanese nicknames, they tend to be... A bit obnoxious. Yeah. I mean, I'm not hating. I love the Japanese language, but it gets very wordy. It gets very wordy, but when you translate to English, it's almost kind of beautiful. (laughs) I remember there was one Japanese MMA fighter. I can't remember her name. I think it was Emi Fujita. And her name translated was Special Attack Angel. Oh my. And I was like, damn. Like, they just always said, like, crazy names and stuff. So, yeah, I, I'm just not surprised by this. You watch, like, any anime that's uh, subtitled. And if you can get direct translations on things, it's, like, wacky names, especially their special moves in an in, in action anime or something like that. I don't have any good examples right now. But, but, yeah. So, this was due to her body being discovered in a concrete drum. The murder was mainly perpetrated by four teenage boys Hiroshi Miyano. Joe Agura. I thought it was uh, Joe so that, Watanabe. Or... The, the other name is what he adopted. Ah, okay. It's like a pseudonym he took later. Okay. Shinji Minato and Yasushi Watanabe. Approximately 100 people knew about Furuta's captivity, but either did nothing about it or themselves participated in the torture and murder. Most of the participants were friends of the teenage boys who were low-ranking members of the Yakuza which is the Japanese mafia for those who are not aware. Furuta was born in Masato, Saitama Prefecture. As a teenager, she attended Yashio Minami High School and worked as a part-time employee during after-school hours. She lived with her parents, her elder brother, and her younger brother. Prior to her abduction, she had accepted a job at an electronics retailer where she planned on working after graduation. One of her schoolmates, Hiroshi Miyano, had a crush on her and asked her out on multiple occasions. However, Furuta turned him down as she was not interested in a relationship. Miyano was a member of the Yakuza and wanted revenge on her. So from what I understand after looking into this, some dispute that he had actually asked her out. But for those that believe that that's what happened, he apparently had never been turned down before. And basically, if that guy came up to you and said he was taking you on a date, you could not say no. And this was the first time somebody said no. So on November 25th, 1988, Miyano and his friend Nobuharu Minato wandered around Misato with the intention of robbing and raping local women. At 8.30 p.m., they spotted Furuta cycling home after she finished her part-time job. Under Miyano's orders, Minato kicked Furuta off her bicycle and immediately fled the scene. Miyano, using the pretense of it being a coincidence he was in the locale, approached Furuta and offered to walk her home safely. It is widely believed that Furuta rejected Miyano's advances towards her. She was unaware that Miyano was leading her to a nearby warehouse where he revealed his Yakuza connections. Miyano threatened to kill her as he raped her in the warehouse and once again in a nearby hotel. From the hotel, Miyano called Minato and his other friends, Joe Ogura and Yasushi Watanabe, and bragged to them about the rape. Ogura reportedly asked Miyano to keep her so they could all have a turn. 
The group had a history of gang rape and had recently kidnapped and raped another girl, although she was released afterward. It's kind of crazy to read this because it's a very rare thing for those that are wondering, oh, are there roving gangs of rapists? No, they're really not. No, there really really isn't. This was kind of like a one-off crazy thing. Yeah, Japan overall is a very safe place. Around 3 a.m., Miyano took Furuta to a nearby park where Minato, Agura, and Watanabe were waiting. They told her that they knew where she lived from a notebook they found in her backpack and that the Yakuza would kill her family if she attempted to escape. She was easily overpowered by the four boys and taken to a house in the Ayase district of Adachi where she was gang raped. The house, which was owned by Minato's parents, soon became their regular gang hangout. So on the 27th of November, Furuta's parents contacted the police about their daughter's disappearance. In order to prevent the manhunt, the kidnappers coerced her into calling her mother. She was forced to say that she had run away but was safe in staying with a friend. She was also forced to ask her mother to stop the police investigation into her disappearance. When Minato's parents were around, Furuta was forced to pose as the girlfriend of one of the kidnappers. They later dropped this pretext when it became clear that the Minatos would not report them to the police. The Minatos stated they did not intervene because they were aware of Miyano Yuzuka connections and feared retaliation, and because their own son was increasingly violent towards them. Minato's brother was also aware of the situation, but did nothing to prevent it. So I read when I was researching this that there was two different accounts of his parents claiming that they had no idea what was going on, that they saw the girl and just thought it was one of their girlfriends, but thought nothing of it and said they never heard anything like that going on. I didn't think that they had admitted to that yet. I don't think they ever officially admitted to it, but common sense says that they absolutely knew what was going on. Like, I don't want to jump ahead. We're going to talk about the sentencing and things like that later. However, I very surprised that the Minatos didn't get arrested themselves just because they were allowing this to go on in their home. In the States, you would get some sort of accessory for that pretty quickly. Yeah, you'd be be accessory to murder in the very least. Yeah. Whether you did truly know it or not, just in the States, like, they don't don't fuck around with shit like that. Because it would be impossible to not know. Let's just be logical here. Yeah, for sure. Furuta was held captive in the Minato residence for 44 days, during which time she was abused, raped, and tortured. They also invited and encouraged their other Yakuza friends to torment Furuta. Now, not all of them were Yakuza. Some of them were just his school friends. According to the trial statements, the four of them raped her over 400 times, beat her, starved her, hung her from the ceiling, and used her as a punching bag. They dropped barbells, like weight barbells, onto her stomach, forced her to eat live cockroaches and drink her own urine, and they forced her to masturbate in front of them. They inserted foreign objects into her vagina and anus, including a lit light bulb, like while still connected to a lamp, and fireworks. They also put meat skewers into her too yeah yakitori ones yeah they put yakitori meat skewers that i believe were hot off the grill yeah they burned her vagina and clitoris with cigarettes and lighters and her eyelids with hot wax they also tore off her left nipple with pliers and pierced her breasts with sewing needles when her body was found oronam and sea bottles were stuck up her anus and her face was unrecognizable She was also found to be pregnant, despite the severe damage to her uterus. Some of the torturer's friends had been officially identified, including Tetsuo Nakamura and Koichi Koichi Ihara, who were charged with the rape after their DNA was found on and in the victim's body. Ihara was allegedly bullied into raping Furuta. After he left the Minato household, he told his brother about the incident. His brother subsequently told their parents, who contacted the police. Two police officers were dispatched to the Minato house. However, they were informed that there was no girl inside. The police officers declined an invitation to look into the house, believing... Hold on. You okay? Yep. You want to talk about it? Are you sure? We can Patreon it. You want to say what you're feeling? Just give me a second. I'll start. Okay. Okay. 
The police officers declined an invitation to look around the house, believing that invitation alone was sufficient proof that there was no girl in the Minato house. Both officers faced considerable backlash from the community. Had they done their due diligence, Fruta's ordeal would have only lasted 16 days. <sighs> Fuck. <laughs> I know this is a hard one. Okay, you do the rest. <laughs> okay, okay. Had they done their due diligence, Faruta's ordeal would have only lasted 16 days, and she may well have recovered from her injuries. The two officers were fired for failing to follow procedure. Do you want me, do you want me to stop? Do you want me to keep going? Keep going. At the beginning of December, Faruta attempted to call the police. However, she was discovered by Miano before she could say anything. When the police phoned back, Miano informed them it was a mistake. As punishment, they doused her legs and feet in lighter fluid and set them on fire. They also pushed a large bottle into her anus, causing severe bleeding. She reportedly went into convulsions. During their trial, they stated that they thought she was faking a seizure, so they set her on fire again. She survived these injuries and continued to be raped and tortured. Furuta is reported to have asked her captors on multiple occasions to kill her and get it over with, but they refused. Instead, they forced her to sleep outside on the balcony, and it was winter at the time. And winter in Japan can get into the negative degrees, even in the mainland. And they also locked her in a freezer, as if the parents didn't know. Right. Of course they knew. One of the kidnappers told the court that her hands and legs were so badly damaged that it took her over an hour to drag herself downstairs to use the bathroom. Yeah, there's no way the parents didn't know. Due to the severity of the torture, she eventually lost bladder and bowel control and was beaten for soiling the carpets. She was also unable to drink water or consume food and would vomit after each attempt. She was also severely beaten for this. The brutality of the attacks drastically altered Fruta's appearance. Her face was so swollen that it was difficult to make out her features. Her body was also severely crippled, giving off a rotting smell that caused the four boys to lose sexual interest in her. As a result, the boys kidnapped and gang raped a 19-year-old woman who, like Feruta, was on her way home from work. I believe that one they didn't capture, though. They just let her go. Right. On the 4th of January in 1989, after losing a game of Mahjong, Hiroshi Miyano decided to vent out his anger on Feruta. At this point, Feruta was barely alive. Out of frustration, the boys beat her with an iron barbell, kicked and punched her, and placed two short candles on her eyelids, burning them with the hot wax. They made her stand and struck her feet with a swinging stick. At this point, she fell onto a stereo and collapsed in a fit of convulsions. Since she was bleeding profusely and pus was emerging from her infected burns, the four boys covered their hands in plastic bags, which were taped at the wrists. They continued to beat her and dropped an iron exercise ball onto her stomach several times. They poured lighter fluid onto her thighs, arms, face, and stomach, and once again set her on fire. Fruta allegedly made attempts to put out the fire, but gradually became unresponsive. The attack reportedly lasted two hours. Fruta eventually succumbed to her wounds and died later that day. Less than 24 hours after her death, Nobuharu Minato's brother called to tell him that Furuta appeared to be dead. Afraid of being caught for murder, they wrapped her body in blankets and shoved it into a travel bag. They then put her body in a 55-gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. Around 8 p.m., they loaded and eventually disposed the drum into a cement truck in Kodo, Tokyo. On 23rd January 1989, Hiroshi Miyano and Joe Agora were arrested for the gang rape of the 19-year-old woman who they kidnapped in December. On March 29th, two police officers came to interrogate them as women's underwear had been found at their addresses. During the interrogation, one of the officers led Miano into thinking he knew of Faruda's murder. What was going on here is they were interrogating them for a different disappearance, but they thought it was, of, it was about Faruda. So thinking that Joe Agora had already confessed to the crime, Miano told the police where to find Faruda's body. The police were initially puzzled by the confession as they had been talking about the murder of another woman and her seven-year-old son that had occurred nine days prior to Faruda's abduction, and that case remains unsolved to this day. I couldn't find anything about names of that case. I, I really did try to look. The police found the drum containing Faruda's body the following day. 
She was identified via fingerprints. On April 1st, 1989, Joe Agora was arrested for another sexual assault and subsequently rearrested for murder. The arrest of Yasushi Watanabe, Nobuharu Minato, and Minato's brother followed. Despite the shocking brutality for their crime, the identities of the boys were sealed by the court since they were all considered to be juveniles at the Jesus time of the crime. Christ. Journalists from the Shukan Bunshan magazine discovered their identities, however, and published them. Good. They stated that given the severity of the crime, the accused did not deserve the right to have their anonymity upheld. All four boys pled guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death rather than murder. I think it was one of them. I think it was Joe Agora was actually not a minor at the time. Right. Because when they published their pictures, they blurred all their eyes out except for his. Yeah, and he looked older. Yeah, he did. In July 1990, a lower court sentenced Hiroshi Miyano, that alleged leader of the crime, to 17 years in prison. Just 17 years in prison. That's all he got. He appealed his sentence, but Tokyo High Court Judge Ryuji Yanase sentenced him to an additional three years in prison. But still 20 years. 20 years for that. The 20-year sentence is the second highest sentence before life imprisonment. He was 18 at the time of the murder. Miano's mother reportedly sent Furuta's parents 50 million yen, the equivalent of 425,000 U.S. dollars at the time. So not by today's money, but 425,000 by 1989. And she got that money by selling the Miano family home. Miano was denied parole in 2004. In January 2013, Miano was rearrested for fraud. Due to insufficient evidence, he was released without charge later that month. So he's out and about. Nobuharu Minato, who originally received a four to six year sentence, was re-sentenced to five to nine years by Judge Ryuichi Yanase upon appeal. Upon appeal. I didn't know they could do that. I don't think that's something they can do in the States. No, but I love that they can do it there. I, I do love they that they can do that. They should have just hung everybody. They sh- well, I mean, you think... I don't care that they're kids. Well, I, do, I don't care either. I mean, there are many murders you can point to in the States where they've tried kids as adults. I don't... I, nobody ever got the death penalty, but yeah, some of them got... Did. Someone did. Roderick Farrell got it as a minor. He got the death penalty in Florida, but his um, sentence was later changed to life. How old was he at the time of the murder? I think he was 17, if oh, I remember okay. correctly. And we'll definitely cover that case because it was one I studied a lot as a teenager. So there were some kids as young as 12, I think, that were... I, I have to look and see what the youngest ever tried as an adult. I swear 12, maybe even younger than that, has been tried as an adult just for like murders and things like that. And these boys were not anywhere close to 12. They were like 16, 17, 18. You know what the great thing is about the death penalty in Japan? Yeah. They don't tell you when they're going to do it, so you have to go to bed every day wondering if they're going to do it to you the next day. I didn't know that. Yep. You it's crazy. Like, get your date. Like, Sutomo Miyazaki got the death penalty. Yeah, but it took years. It did. Yeah, it did. It took, like, 20 years for him to be executed. He had to kill kids. It's just so crazy to me. So, Nobuhiro Minato was 16 at the time of the murder. Nobuharu's parents and brother were not charged. Furuta's parents were dismayed by the sentences received by their daughter's killers and won a civil suit against the parents of Nobuharu Minato, in whose home the crimes were committed. After his release, Minato moved in with his mother. He has not been able to find work since. Yasushi Watanabe, who was originally sentenced to three to four years in prison. Jesus Christ. An upgraded sentence to five to seven years. It really looks like these guys shouldn't have been pushing their luck with this judge because he gives no fucks. He was 17 at the time of the murder. After his release, he married a Romanian woman. For his participation in the crime, Joe Agora served eight years in juvenile prison before he was released in August 1999. He was 17 at the time of the murder. After his release, he is said to have boasted about his role in the kidnap. This this guy is one of the worst ones. After his release, he's said to have boasted about his role in the kidnapping, rape, and torture of Furuta. In July 2004, he was arrested for assaulting Takatoshi Isono, an acquaintance he thought his girlfriend may have been involved with. Agora tracked Asano down, beat him, and shoved him into his truck. He drove him from Adachi to his mother's bar in Masato, where he allegedly beat Isono for four hours. 
During that time, Agora repeatedly threatened to kill the man, telling him that he'd kill, he had killed before and knew how to get away with it. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for the assault and has since been released. Agora's mother allegedly vandalized Feruda's grave, stating that she had ruined her son's life. It has also been reported that Agora had run through his father's savings, money which was originally meant for Feruda's family, buying and consuming a number of luxury goods. The sentences were largely regarded as being far too light for the crimes committed, you don't fucking say. Yeah. All four individuals were protected by special provisions applied to individuals 18 years old and younger. During the sentencing, the judge commented that exceptionally grave and atrocious violence had been inflicted upon the victim and that Junko Furuta had been murdered so brutally at the young age of 17 that her soul must be wandering in torment. Hearing the details of the brutal rape and torture, a spectator in the gallery fainted. Furuta's mother also reportedly had a mental breakdown which required psychiatric treatment. Junko Furuta's funeral was held on April 2, 1989. One of her friend's memorial address stated, Junshan, welcome back. I have never dreamed that we would see you again in this way. You must have been in so much pain, so much suffering. The happy we all made for the school festival looked really good on you. We will never forget you. I have heard that the headmaster has presented you with a graduation certificate. So we graduated together, all of us. Junshan, there is no more pain, no more suffering. Please rest in peace. Faruta's part-time employer, whom she worked for prior to her kidnapping and murder, presented her parents with the uniform she would have worn as a full-time employee. She was working as an employee for an electronics store, if I remember correctly. The uniform was placed in her casket. The location near where Faruta's body was discovered has been developed since and is now Wakasu Park. People around Hiroshi Miyano remember that he never forbade others from asking him about this murder. While talking about it, he was always playful and exultant, and acted as if it was none of his business. Thus, Shukin Bunshin criticized him for being completely unrepentant, and unfortunately, I agree with them. This is one of the most brutal single murders I've ever come across. Maybe even the most brutal, more brutal than strings of murders I've read about. Right. And clearly I have a hard time with it, so... And And I watch a lot of really fucked up shit. Yeah. I think the thing about this is... It's not just abducting somebody and killing them in a brutal way. It's torturing them for that long. If she didn't succumb, they would have kept torturing her. This never would have ended. It never would have ended. Killing her was not intentional. It was an accident. Let that sink in for a second. The intentions, just how evil you have to be to do this. And somebody's literally begging you for death. And it's just unrecognizable. Their body's broken beyond any sort of repair. It's just so hard to just fathom just what that takes in a person to do. Just what kind of a human you have to be to do something like that. And I really... I don't believe that the parents had no idea about this. How do you have no idea about this? Obviously, you're going to hear a girl screaming in the house, especially when all that's happening. When you have we have several boys gang raping her and beating her and just abusing her in so many different ways. And it wasn't just those boys either. They did state in multiple sources that the 400 rapes, there was over 100 men that raped her jesus christ so there was like a line of people going in and out of the house because they they knew what was yeah what was going on just think about that just how evil are we as humans how many people would just do something like this because the opportunity was there how many people have a hand in this and are still alive today and have that on their conscience probably all of them it's just crazy to think about how many people are walking free now that never stood trial, were never implicated. They probably got to go and lead normal lives. Well, I know you wanted to touch a little bit on bystander apathy. Yeah, so this case reminded me of the Kitty Genovese case. And for those that don't know, it was a woman who was attacked, just a random act of violence, 
by somebody who was arguably a serial killer, killed, well, admitted to killing two other people, but the police refused to convict him. So he just saw her walking down a street in Queens, New York. He parked his car. He ran over to her and started stabbing her. And she was screaming for help in a busy neighborhood. And nobody really did anything. One person yelled, leave that woman alone. Nobody called the cops. Nobody did anything. He left the scene, came back with a wide-brimmed hat, found her. She had crawled into an alleyway and was trying to get somebody to let her in and nobody would let her in and he stabbed her a lot raped her and mugged her and she died later and at the time they had thought there was about 38 witnesses that did nothing in 2016 after revisiting the case the new york times said that was grossly overstated but they couldn't from what i read couldn't name the amount of witnesses there actually were. However, it is to say that there were witnesses that definitely heard but didn't do anything. Because this is just the thing. People don't want to get involved in conflict. People feel like it's their place and people have a hard time acting. It was more than just that, though. There were people who literally pulled chairs up to their windows and watched. There was some sort of elevator operator who saw everything and rather than doing anything, just went downstairs and went to bed. Yes, that is true. It's been a while since I've looked into this case, so I'm going off of memory right now. Yeah, but there that's were true. other people who claimed they didn't do anything about it because they didn't want to be inconvenienced with going down to the station to do any paperwork. Yeah. And, and like she was pounding on people's doors. Yeah. And there was someone, I guess, in the hallway or an entryway, kind of like we have at the apartment here, who wouldn't let her in. Yeah, I heard about that. And... Finally, when somebody did let her in, she was basically dead at that point, and she died in that person's arms. Or, I'm sorry, she died on, on the way to the hospital when an ambulance finally came, but she was already unconscious by that point. And this was the case that established 911 in New York City. And I'm not sure if that's where 911 originated, but I know that 911 did not exist in New York City up until then. I think where... The Junko Furuta case is different, is that a lot of people could claim bystander apathy due to fear because the Yakuza are a very feared entity in Japan. Japan is a safe place, but it's expected that you stay out of the Yakuza's way. You can usually see a Yakuza walking a mile away, or so I've read from people who've lived there. Again, yeah. like I've never lived there, but a Yakuza has much different body language. They have body language more like people here here in America do. Somebody that would be walking very boisterous and they wear very flashy clothes, whereas your average citizen will be walking with closed body posture, eyes averted, things of that nature. And they're very tattooed generally. Yes. Which is also very annoying because... Due to that fact, there's a very big stigma about foreign people going to the springs and bathhouses in Japan. So, because tattoos mean gangs, mean so gangs are the yakuza. So poor Yurgi is gonna have a hard time with that. So unless you're like maybe a Japanese punk, I think I've seen tattoos on on Japanese punk rockers and stuff. But in in general, the vast majority of Japanese citizens do not have tattoos. Right. But the yakuza, there's just such this aspect that you don't mess with them stay out of their way. You don't want to get involved with that because it's not just you, it's your entire family that could go down for it. So knowing that these boys had connection to the Yakuza, you can see why some people felt like they could not do anything. I think that's different than the Kitty Genovese case where... People just did nothing. Yeah, they, people were safe in their own home. This was not a thing like, oh, no, it's the, it's the Italian mob. I, I can't do anything about this. It wasn't like that at all. The Italian mob wouldn't have done that. Right. The Italian. I'm just giving an yeah, example. I'm, I'm just be saying. <laughs> because like, what's, what's the equivalent right, to the Yakuza yeah. at that period of time? Probably be the Italian mob. As much as I understand people's fear for something like this, you would think there's a way to anonymously report it. I mean, ultimately, what got them in trouble was one of the boys told his brother and his brother told the cops. He was like the only one. And they got arrested and caught on it on circumstance. They were investigating another murder. Since she was forced to call and say, stop looking for me, I'm happy, she could have gone missing forever. Yeah, she could have. Once one of those oil drums are disposed of, done. 
nobody ever would have known. And you stop to think how many people go that way. And like due to the fact that that place is developed now. Yes. It could have went right to the bottom of a lake or have been buried and just yeah. developed over and nobody would have known. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we have this horrible case of Junko Furuta. How many other women in countries and places that is conducive to things of this nature, how many of them go missing and are never seen from again? How many people get away with that? I just don't know. That happens in Maine. So if you think about the James Hicks cases, which we're eventually going to cover at one point, it's the case up in Carmel, Maine. Yes, yes. He got away with two murders for a very long time because they couldn't pin it on him and they couldn't find the bodies. And because Maine, especially up north, is so vast and pretty much undeveloped. Yeah. You know, how many people are just out in the woods here? We still have uncharted territories. Yeah. Driving around since I've driven out in that area, even in, in the daytime, it's kind of eerie in its own way. For every Junko Furuta, how many... You you would like to think that Junko Furuta is a sign that if you do something like this, you will inevitably be caught. But the way I think of it is, is that for every Junko Furuta that's discovered, how many more are not discovered in places that are conducive to this? Yeah. And maybe that's hard to wrap your head around if you didn't grow up in a place like we did. Yeah, and that happens in Tokyo. You mean this happened in right, Tokyo? Yeah, they basically almost got away with it. Yeah, Saitama. Yeah, basically in the the greater Tokyo area. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't like this was in more rural Japan. This was in one of the most major metropolitan cities in the world. Now, granted, it was in a more suburban area, but still, it's just crazy to think how many people had to have known and did absolutely nothing. And how many times has something like this happened? In a neighborhood like this, you hear girls screaming or crying or what have you. And to think of how Japan has developed. Now, I don't know how this particular street was, how the houses were, or anything like that. But Japan is known for being very overdeveloped and overcrowded, especially in the greater Tokyo area. And even in the suburban areas, the houses are kind of one on top of the other. Right. So, with that said... How in the hell do you not hear a woman screaming in a, in a situation like that? I, I will try to research addresses and what it looked like then. But it wasn't like this was the 50s. It, it was, was the it, 80s. It was the late 80s. It was, all, it was 1989. I just don't believe that nobody could have known. I believe that a lot of people knew. And sure, a lot of them were good people that just were scared for their own families. But if it went this way, how often did that happen? Not just there, but in places like that. I can't even begin to imagine. I could only speculate on the answer. I think that's the part that's that really scares me. Okay. I did a little bit of research here, and I'm going to just hand over the phone. That's where it happens. It's in a pretty populated city-looking yeah. area. I mean, geez, this looked like downtown. Looks like downtown Boston to me, or like downtown like Chinatown in Boston. I, I was going to say, that's what the buildings well, look like. well, there was uh, in downtown New Orleans, there were some buildings like that too. Yeah, and to think that this was a $425,000 house in 1989 money. So obviously, this was expensive, I do, and it didn't look like it was in the middle of nowhere. I totally failed to consider that part of it. I don't know. When I always visualize this in my head, for some reason, though it wasn't in city Tokyo, I always just thought of it on some in some sort of weird high rise, which clearly, you know, now looking at the pictures, that's not the case. I thought it was this rural suburban area. I always pictured it. This house down a side street or something like that, kind of in the middle of nowhere. I, I don't know how to explain it without somebody being familiar what some suburbs in Japan look like. I thought it to be a more a more rural area, but... It clearly was not, and no. I, I always forget it was in the greater Tokyo area. Do you want to talk about why this case in particular gets you so upset? Um, I guess I could touch a little bit about it. I'll try to keep it together. Okay. So being someone who's gone through multiple sexual assaults myself, things like this kind of set me off a little bit. Although we've covered many, many cases in the past where people have been sexually assaulted and it hasn't really affected me, for some reason this one does. I don't know if it's how things were done or because I am a vagina-owning person, I start visualizing this in my head. 
and start getting rather empathetic. Yeah, I mean, you're brutally tortured. It's like when a guy gets hit in the balls, you, you're you just like, uh, you feel for him. And that was a crude example, but. Well, right, but a decent parallel, I guess. Mm. But thinking about it and then I start visualizing it starts like overwhelming me. Yeah. I think what makes me sick to my stomach, because it's what, again, it's one thing to be tortured and killed, but to be tortured and kept for the sake of continually being tortured that's just so evil to me that's just so evil you're, you're just literally like they would have kept going for as long as they could with her i don't think they thought in their head that what they were doing could kill her you know i've, I've mentioned before i watch a lot of fucked up shit i listen to a lot of fucked up shit for lack of a better term have been watching like snuff related things you know since i was a teenager or at least true death stuff and nothing has ever affected me like this case does yeah i get the same reaction anytime i listen to the case and you look at pictures of her this is a girl very young just about to graduate high school seemed beloved by her peers and all she did was allegedly turn someone down and even if she didn't some guy just looked at her and said i'm gonna kidnap her and do all these evil things and i'm sure she wasn't even mean about it no, I, I'm sure she wasn't. It's just you don't turn down Yakuza, or at least that guy. That's what people said about him is that you don't say no to him. He was a known bully, and he had connections, and he was used to getting his way. I've met a lot of people that are used to getting their way. I've never known anyone close to that. I don't know. I don't even know how you think to do any of these things. And I find myself pretty depraved at times, but just to the level of where they took it is like pretty insane. They took it to places where most people wouldn't even have the capability of imagining. If you were to take an average person and told them you have to torture somebody, what would you do to them? I'm sure most of them would not think of the things that they did. It's crazy. It's crazy to me. Is there anything else you want to say? I think I've I, I've said all I really can with it. I don't want to go too far into my experiences just because that could be another social episode that we do. And yeah. obviously I don't want to take away from the depravity of this with yeah. my own oh. things that were not this crazy, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that's all I have. And I'm glad we got through it. Yeah. Oh, I also want to say that this is one of the rare cases where... The case is known by the victim's name and not the perpetrators. And I don't know if that's due to the severity of things. I know there was a group of them, but usually they'll give a name to the group. The media will. It's just unfortunate that something like this has to happen in order for us to start memorializing the victim and not the perpetrators, which true crime has a propensity to do. It has a fetish almost. Yes. And I, I don't want to go too far into this because I feel it would be crude of me to go on this tangent in a case like this. But I feel like a lot of people in true crime have such fetishes for gory details and perpetrators, but are ready to just rip other people apart or podcasters apart that act in the way which they secretly do. This genre gets pretty sick at times. It can. It really can. Okay, well, let's try to end this on not such a sour note. I, I just feel like I'm not doing it justice. If you find interest in this case, I would say go and look up a picture of Junko Furuta. She has a few pictures online just so you can, just so you can appreciate somebody in the prime of their life that seemed happy and seemed to have everything going for them. Yeah, I don't think even, I don't think anybody can do justice to this case. I don't think that's possible. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. But if there's if there's one step in the right direction that you can do that most people do not do when they ingest true crime, go look at the victim and just just take time to remember the victim and not the perpetrator. I think if there's any case that you'd want to do that for, it's this one. So if you've gotten this far, thank you for listening. Yes, not, yes, thank you. I'm not going to plug the social media. I don't feel it's appropriate. We will be back next week. So we love you. We love you very much. Bye. Bye.